Today we came here for a, an official meeting and actually this is the progress report 8 uh, during a long process and like in before every progress report let me just give some uh, insights concerning uh, the center and uh, what we are doing. So medical science is always start from discoveries when we are in the laboratory, when we are in the patient uh, side, and we try to have information to collect to a huge uh, database. However, after this, this is highly important not only to discover, but also to deliver the things to the patient sides. So if I look at the whole medical science, it started from the question and finishing at the patient side. If I look at the scientific activities, how it was growing in the last century, we can immediately realize how many articles now published annually, almost 2,000 articles. And it's very important to understand how this kind of generated data can come back for patients' benefits. Let's stop a little bit. Let's think about how many knowledge we have in the past. Let's make a decision we stop science doing today and the human being cannot do more science in the future, but we would use all the knowledge we have generated in the past in the, for community benefits. And there is a huge statistical data by the, by the Academy of Europe and the Eurostat and they showed that annually 1.7 million people dies, but 1.2 million people's lives could have been saved if the human population used all the knowledge for prevention, for effective treatment, and for patients' follow-ups. And if especially we look at Eastern and Central Europe, five from five people, four deaths four or five deaths could have been avoided if all the knowledge is used. So we strongly believe that in the 21st century, a new kind of system is necessary for healthcare professionals, which take them low to bring this huge amount of knowledge back for patient size. Of course, now we have a problem in the past, but we need to innovate. We have new system which let this uh, whole system works. And this was the reason why first at the University of Page, in 1st of January 2016, uh, the Center for Translational Medicine established. And in 2021, it came to Budapest, to Semmelweis University. And this program was started two years ago at Semmelweis University. And the aim is very clear science into healthcare. We need to bring this knowledge back for patients' benefits. And our mission statement of this center is to have a breakthrough change in science, education, and medical training. So this is the old model. You can see which in every phases, so from the question to the discovery to the delivery are done by different personals. However, the transition time between the each parts are really slow, and sometimes after one discovery, it takes 10 years, 15, 20 years to come to patients' benefits. I really feel myself as a privilege, and uh, it's, I deliberately put the Academy of Europea uh, uh, point next to the Semmelweis one, because this is an organization with a high knowledge, with 4,008 100 members, 83 of them are Nobel laureates, and they are really highly qualified people. And we had the privilege to lead, actually, the, the project of translational medicine, where we immediately put, put healthcare as a center. And this is now a, a model which, starting as a PhD student, science activity of healthcare, and doing scientific activation, uh, activity, have a knowledge, and coming back for, for community benefits. And we were very pleased to see that actually our effort, Academy of Europe effort, were not only good 
uh, development, but also internationally highly recognized, and one of the top journals, Nature Medicine, actually uh, accepted it for a publication. The major aim, and this is why I started, here we are not for elevating the number of impact factors generally, but have our patients a better healthcare. And I can show plenty of data. One of them is, for example, at the University of Page, where with the scientific activity within a year, we could decrease the usage of antibiotic with 50%, the mortality in, seven, uh, in severe, severe pancreatitis to one third. We could decrease the cost because we immediately bring the, the scientific knowledge for patients' benefits. The other example, for example, from Heimpal hospitals, where uh, Andrea Parnitsky and Aniko Knight teams started to bring the screening for CF patients, the, the, the diabetes screening, much earlier than the guideline says, due to the recent data analysis they have uh, done. So they started not at the age of 10, but at the age of 4, and they could identify 30% of young people without they have visual impairment and some other trouble of uh, uh, diabetes mellitus before they uh, had the symptoms. And they could make prevention actions. Or another students from uh, the third year ones, uh, actually uh, Kata Illich and Tomas Horvat from the Bojci Hospital, they analyzed clear data how to treat cholesterol recurrence, and they were actually really brilliant and not only could publish it in a good D1 journals, but in the hospital, they immediately set up this technique and within a year, they could reduce the cholesterol recurrence for with 13%. So this program is really for patients' benefits. Here are the numbers. We started recently the third year. It's quite stable, the number. Approximately, we have like 90 students every year, all of them coming from, from healthcare. And here is the number for Semmelweis universities where approximately 1,000 PhD students. Now, 20% of the total number of PhD students coming from this program. And if I look at the international ones, we are really very proud. 28% of the current number of international students at Semmelweis University coming to this pro from this program. So altogether, we have students from 21 different countries and 40 different institutions. The field of research is open for everything. We have pharmacists, we have dietitians, we have gastroenterologists, the dentists, and plenty of different students. And one of the, 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 the rising, uh, uh, actually, field of research is definitely dermatology and immunology. Here is just a little bit about how this program looks like. We don't have like the, the semantic lectures and, uh, and, uh, and, and seminars, but we have several different kind of educations from e-learning to, to troubleshooting to multidisciplinary discussions. We, of course, teach all clinical methodology for all students, so they must be, by the end of the PhD, a very good understanding of the methodology of, uh, of, of each clinical uh, issues. And also, we not only try to help them to do it better, their hard skills, but also we have soft skill management as well. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the eight progress report. So the student needs to, to make official presentations in front of a committee every part of the uh, uh, year. In the first year, they have to do it four times. In the second year, they have to do it two times. And after that, the, uh, the home defense and public defense are coming. In year three, this was the first year in 2021, 91 students started. But this is not guaranteed that you can stay in the program. So after three months, five students left the program because, uh, because they didn't have the protected time or they didn't uh, go forward well. And 74 students in last, or this year, June, they passed the complex exam. And now I am very happy to say that we have the first bird uh, here today, who actually passed the, the uh, public def uh, home defense last week, and here today will be the very first 
public defense at CTM. This is just the numbers. We have 264 students. Currently, if I count all the project students, supervisors, everybody, we have more than 500 people now get giving education for clinical science. Currently, the center, the 264 students running 541 uh, studies. 151 are already published. 134 are in the submitted phase. And currently, within two years, here are the cumulative impact factors and the average impact factors. So I just would like to finish, actually, my introduction with a quote by the uh, vice rector, Peter Ferdinand. When we had the opening ceremony, he said that innovation is not about ideas. It's about making ideas happen. So I also saw today that dreams without execution are only like hallucinations. So I think the major issue is here today that see what at the end of the day uh, this program will add to the system. At the first progress report eight, we have a privilege to have a brilliant students, I think, and the, and the supervisor and the, and the school. And uh, this is the, the last moment for me, like in every progress report. And because now it's turning this progress report to a really a public defense. I briefly would like to introduce, as we discussed with the chairman, the committee, and, and the structure of the meeting. I'm very happy to, to introduce here George Reus, the chairman of the clinical doctoral school at Semmelweis University, who I will hand over the mic uh, within shortly. We have two opponents. Usually in this program, one of them will be an international one. So I am very happy to introduce Bogdan Yonal Tamba from the University of Yash, which is a collaborating uh, university with, uh, with the Semmelweis one. He is a leading uh, scientist. They are leading the, the, the center of excellence in science uh, in, uh, in, in Yash. And uh, he took the, one of the opponent position. The other one, Jolt Molnar, I think uh, many of you know him. He is a, a leading intensive care and, and anesthesiologist specialist. He has been from the very beginning of the program also in Page and, and, and also at Semmelweis University. We have two members of the committee from two very distinguished universities of Hungary. One of them is Zsuzsanna Helyes, who is uh, actually from the University of Pécs. She is a leading pharmacologist scientist uh, there, and she took the the, the uh, member's position like today, and uh, she is also a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, what is really a huge achievement uh, uh, at that stage of her career, so I really congratulate a lot. And we have uh, Roland Julai also from the University of Szeged, partially like some of us as well from the University of Pécs as well. He is currently the head of the Department of Dermatology in Szeged, and he is like a special expert and member of the committee will be here. The committee will be extended by two officials from CTM. One of them I also would like to introduce, but maybe most of the people I think don't need uh, uh, introduction by Tomás Koi from the Technical University from the BME. Uh, he is a mathematician and if any questions uh, rising or he has questions, uh, he's more than happy to ask. And we have a secretary of the meeting who is writing the, the, the memos and memorandums and Alexander Schulze-Wenning who is uh, also a third year PhD student. I am happy to stop here. And I wish everybody an enjoy, enjoyable uh, aid progress support. And please, Mr. Chairman, lead the, the meeting. So thank you very much. It's a very important stage of your career now because you worked four years. You had a lot of presentations, but now you have to summarize all that you have in your head. You have to be... Uh, you have to show us that you are really prepared and that all your work you have done is of meaning, so we are waiting for this. And to know some 
more data about you, I have to ask your supervisor, Banvergyi András, to present the CV of the, of the PhD candidate. Welcome everybody. The committee, as you can hear, I'm stuttering as it did not pass me in the last 40 years. This will be the same in this five minutes. I'm very, very happy and honored that, that I can present the remarkable biography of Fanny. And I want to start. Fanny Adel Mesnerich was born and in 1996 and raised in Budapest, Hungary. After completing her high school education at Város Majori Gymnasium, she began her medical studies in 2015 at Samuels University Faculty of Medicine. As a fourth year medical student, she joined she joined the research team of the photobiology and photocarcinogenesis laboratory at the Department of the Dermatology, Venerology, and Dermato-Oncology, led by Professor Vikonkal, and she also started her scientific work at the TDK student under my guidance. She successfully completed her medical degree in 2021, graduating with summa cum laude recognition. Following her graduation, Fanny immersed herself in PhD studies, continuing to work under my supervision and joining the PhD program at the Center for Trans Translational Medicine. Then, in her second year of the PhD studies, she took on the role of a scientific methodology supervisor and a deputy first year coordinator at the Center for Trans Translational Medicine as well, joining the projects of eight first year students. From the academic year, 2023-2024 onward, she actively participates in the dermatology group, work as an SMS and a junior supervisor. In addition to being the first author of the three pub publications forming uh, the basis of her PhD thesis, she has actively con contributed as a co-author to numerous other publications. Her research contributions have been showcased at various conferences, including the Samuelweiss International Students Conference, where she received several awards during her graduate studies. And furthermore, she has presented her work at, at many national and international national conferences as a PhD student. And not to forget, in her free time, Fanny recharged by staying active with running, hiking, buying, dancing, finding the balance between physical exertion and relaxation. And finally, I would like to emphasize I'm very, very happy and proud to be the mentor of Fanny, and I'm happy to say I not just taught a lot of things to Fanny, but also to learn a lot of things from her. Thanks. Thank you very much for presenting Fanny, who, uh, despite her young age, has already remarkable achievements. And now, Fanny, please show us what is your science. 15 to 20 minutes you have, and then we will discuss it. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, dear committee, uh, dear audience, let me present you the, uh, my PhD topic, which is New Frontiers in Disease Activity Monitoring and Therapy in the Field of Dermatology and Rheumatology. I'm Fanny Mesnerich, and I'm a PhD student and the resident doctor at the Department of Dermatology, Venerology, and Dermato-Oncology, Semmelweis University, and I work under the supervision of uh, András Bánvöldi. 
um, as Peter always mentions, uh, everyone needs a great uh, uh, methodological team besides a clinical team. So this is my uh, team who helped me throughout the years, my Ferrari team, as Peter always mentions in uh, his presentations. And my uh, vision when I started my PhD studies was that patients with chronic dermatological and rheumatological disorders could have a better quality of life. And I would like to achieve that by urging the implementation of novel disease monitoring and modifying methods in clinical practice. Uh, for this, of course, I needed specific goals. So here I'd like to present my three studies. Uh, the first one is focusing on the investigation of the utility of a novel disease monitoring system, MBDS score, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, while my second and my third studies about the investigation of the efficacy of a novel treatment modality, platelet rich plasma, in two dermatological conditions, chronic wounds, and uh, in the treatment of alopecia areata. So a bit about my first uh, project, investigation the utility of MBD score for the monitoring of rheumatoid arthritis. And I would like to start by uh, explaining why uh, is this topic important. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic auto-inflammatory disease with a prevalence of 0.5%. The intensive monitoring of the disease activity is crucial for the treat-to-target therapeutic approach. However, there are mainly subjective and non-specific <coughs> monitoring parameters at hand, like dust rate CRP and DSR, which besides the inflammatory markers also contain the clinical assessment of uh, the clinician or the patient. Uh, so MBD score. Uh, or multi-biomarker disease activity score is uh, only calculated from the same level of 12 biomarkers, so it is uh, an objective uh, tool for disease monitoring. And as it not only contains the uh, inflammatory markers usually included in uh, conventional disease activity measures, but also the markers of cartilage and bone damage, it can also be a potential tool uh, for the prediction of radiographic progression. So our aim was to determine the correlation of MBD score with conventional disease activity measures to assess its utility for disease activity monitoring and also the predictive value of MBD score uh, for radiographic progression. So what were our specific clinical questions? Our first question was if MBD score correlates with conventional disease activity measures. Uh, and for this, we assessed the population of patients diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and we compared MBD score to conventional disease activity measures, and we hypothesized that MBD score correlates with conventional disease activity measures. Our second question was uh, related uh, to the uh, utility of MBD score for the prediction of radiographic progression, and we assessed the same population and compared two patient groups, patients with high Bayesian MBD score to patients with low Bayesian MBD score. And we hypothesized that uh, the odds for radiographic progression are uh, higher in patients with high Bayesian MBD score than in patients with low Bayesian MBD score. So uh, how did we answer these questions exactly? We chose the methodology, methodology of systematic review and meta-analysis and followed the, uh, uh, hand, the Cochrane Handbook's recommendations and reported our results uh, according to the PRISMA guidelines. First, we uh, registered that protocol at Prospero. Then we conducted a systematic search in five medical databases with a search key which you can see displayed. And uh, our systematic search uh, resulted more than 1,000 hits. Um, after duplicate removal, uh, more than 700 articles were screened uh, by two reviewers. And the Kohans Kappa shows us the agreement between the reviewers. And finally, we could include 32 uh, studies eligible for analysis. Uh, first, I would like to show our results regarding uh, the utility of MBD score for disease activity monitoring and for this, the correlations of MBD score with conventional disease activity measures. Here is our first forest plot. Um, here we can see the uh, publications included uh, uh, that compared uh, MBD score to dastonate CRP and dastonate uh, ESR. And, uh, here are the total number of patients included in these studies displayed, and also the correlation coefficients reported separately uh, in each study. And the pooled correlation coefficients, which were 0.4 and 0.56, which are low and moderate correlations. If we move forward to the predictive value of MBD score for radiographic progression, uh, we can see here also the uh, odds ratios reported in each study, and the pooled odds ratio, which was 1.03. Uh, which means that the odds for radiographic progression were 3% higher in patients with high Bayesian MBD score than in patients with low Bayesian MBD score. And this difference between the two patient groups was also statistically significant. If we compare this uh, to uh, high and low baseline levels of DAS28 CRP, uh, we can see similar tendencies. However, 
the difference between these two patient groups was not statistically significant. So we comprehensively assessed both the utility of uh, MBD uh, score for disease activity monitoring and also the predictive value of MBD score for the prediction of radiographic progression. However, we included studies with relatively small patient numbers uh, uh, using differing follow-up times and also different, different cutoff values were used um, uh, for the definition of high and low baseline levels of dust 28 CRP, which are our main limitations. And in conclusion, we can say that MBD scores showed low and moderate correlations with conventional disease activity measures and maybe an independent predictor of radiographic progression. And how could we use these results in the future? Uh, MBD score, uh, as it is an objective measurement, could greatly supplement the conventionally used um, disease activity measurements, which also uh, contain the clinical assessment uh, of the disease, and uh, it could help further personalize the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis patients with close disease activity monitoring. And it uh, may also uh, influence initial therapeutic choices following the establishment of the diagnosis by urging the earlier use of highly potent therapies in case of a potentially higher chance for radiographic progression. Future studies to enable uh, further comprehensive analysis um, should use uh, larger patient, includes larger patient cohorts, uh, use standardized follow-up times, and also uh, uniformized cutoff values uh, for the definition of high and low ba uh, levels of dust donate CRP should be used. Uh, moving on to the second project, the investigation of the efficacy of platelet-rich plasma in chronic wound management. I would like to introduce the topic using the same uh, framework. Uh, so why is this topic important? Chronic wounds are common medical conditions that have a high impact on the aging population. The cost of wound management is estimated to account for 5.5% of all healthcare expenditure, and chronic wounds can also lead to a serious deterioration in patients' quality of life. The standard treatment is smart dressing and compression. However, the special bandages which are used are not the only thing which are making the ulcer management so expensive, but also the human resources, because the recovery time is really long. So if there's an additional treatment modality which could shorten this recovery time, it would not only be beneficial for the patient's quality of life, but would also decrease the burden of wound management on the healthcare system. Uh, platelet rich plasma could be this add-on treatment modality, and as it contains concentrated growth factors and cytokines, it can promote tissue repair and regeneration. So our aim was to evaluate the effects of platelet rich plasma on wound healing in chronic wounds. Our clinical question was if additional therapy with PRP enhances wound healing in chronic wounds compared to conventional ulcer therapy alone. And for this, we assess the population of patients diagnosed with chronic wounds, comparing PRP uh, in addition to conventional ulcer therapy to conventional ulcer therapy alone. And our primary outcome was complete closure, while secondary outcomes included healing time, infection, pain, amputation, and adverse events. And our hypothesis was that additional therapy with PRP is superior to conventional ulcer therapy alone. You can see here some information about our search and selection process. We conducted our search in 2021 October in four medical databases with the search key. And uh, finally, we could include 48 eligible uh, studies. Uh, and I would like to present our results regarding our primary outcome, complete closure. Uh, we can see here the number of uh, completely closed wounds, both in the platelet rich plasma group and in the control group, and also the odds ratios calculated study by study, and the pooled, pooled odds ratio, uh, which means here that the odds for complete closure were more than five times higher in the PRP group than in the control group, and this difference between the two groups was also statistically significant. We also conducted several subgroup analyses uh, to further understand the potential differences between um, different uh, groups. Uh, first, we started with the uh, ulcer etiology, and we can see similar tendencies here uh, as I've shown previously, uh, both in the diabetic ulcer group and in the venous ulcer group, the uh, odds for complete closure were significantly higher in the PRP group than in the control group. And also, we could detect a statistically significant subgroup difference, showing that venous ulcers, ulcers show the greater tendency for healing when treated with PRP compared to diabetic ulcers. If we move further to our next subgroup analysis, um, subgrouping based on the application method of PRP, we can also see similar results, both in the topically applied PRP group and in the injected PRP group. The odds for complete closure were significantly higher in the PRP group than in the control group. And although we can see a, a tendency favoring uh, injected uh, PRP over topical PRP, uh, we could not detect a statistically significant subgroup difference here. 
So we only included our cities in our study to uh, achieve the highest possible quality of evidence, and we had relatively large sample sizes. However, the, uh, the control groups uh, used were quite diverse, and uh, also uh, the reporting of the uh, secondary outcome uh, was quite diverse, so we could not conduct uh, a quantitative analysis regarding this. We summarized these results uh, in a systematic review part of our publication. And in conclusion, we can say that platelet-rich plasma treatment, uh, in addition to conventional ulcer therapy, is superior to conventional ulcer therapy alone in the treatment of chronic wounds. And PRP, uh, in combination with smart dressings, uh, would enable further personalized treatment of uh, patients and also could shorten the recovery time, benefic beneficial both for patients and for the healthcare system. And future studies uh, would enable further um, uh, comprehensive analysis by uniformly reporting their outcome measures, uh, especially related to in infection, adverse event rates, and uh, also uh, to unifor uh, use uniformized control groups. Uh, the, the best would be to use uh, s uh, in smart dressings in a control group. And our uh, third study is the investigation of the efficacy of PRP in alopecia areata. And uh, alopecia areata is an autoimmune condition where you can see inflammation induced, usually patchy hair loss. It can affect the scalp, the beard, or even the whole body, leading to a serious deterioration in patient's quality of life. The lifetime incidence risk of alopecia areata is estimated at 2.1%, and regarding the treatment options, triamcinone acetonide is the first line of treatment in localized alopecia areata, and uh, as it is an intralesionally administered corticosteroid, there are some concerns with this treatment modality. One of them is adverse events, like uh, atrophy, and the other one is steroid phobia, which is a more and more commonly seen phenomenon in the field of dermatology when patients fear the steroid treatment and therefore don't want to get the steroid treatment. So when any of these problems occur, platelet rich plasma can be a great, a great alternative. And as I've mentioned, it contains concentrated growth factors and cytokines, so it can not only promote tissue repair, reg uh, repair and regeneration, but also hair regrowth. So our aim was to evaluate the effects of PRP on hair regrowth in alopecia areata. Uh, a clinical question was uh, if platelet rich plasma is safe and as effective as triamcinone acetonide, the gold standard treatment uh, in the treatment of alopecia areata. And we assessed the population of patients diagnosed with alopecia areata of the scalp and compa compared PRP to triamcinone acetonide. And our primary outcome was hair regrowth, estimated with the help of the SALT score, which is severity of alopecia 2 score. SALT score shows us the percentage of hair loss affecting the scalp. So the greater the decrease in SALT score is, the better the improvement. And our secondary outcomes included adverse event rates and recurrence rates. And our hypothesis was that PRP is as efficient as triamcinone acetonide in the treatment of alopecia areata. Here's uh, some information about our search and selection process. Finally, we could include six studies in our analysis. Uh, from these six studies, we could include four in the quantitative analysis, and I would like to show the results of these on this slide, um, the mean decrease of SALT score in the PRP and the TRA groups. Um, and here we can see that the mean difference between the two groups regarding the change of SALT score was 2.04, which is not a clinically relevant difference and also not a statistically significant difference. However, we can see a tendency uh, favoring triamcinone acetonide. And, uh, uh, moving forward to the secondary outcomes, we could not conduct a quantitative analysis regarding these outcomes, but if we look at the publications assessing these separately, we can see that the main concern with PRP treatment uh, and the only uh, uh, problem uh, was the pain related to administration, while atrophy was reported in several cases in the triamcinone acetonide groups of uh, almost all studies. And uh, regarding recurrence rates, um, all studies assessing recurrence rates uh, uh, showed that uh, recurrence rates were higher in the triamcinone acetonide group than in the PRP group. Uh, so we conducted the first meta-analysis to compare the efficacy of PRP to triamcinone acetonide in alopecia areata. However, we, used, uh, we could only include a small number of studies with small patient numbers, with relatively sh uh, short follow-up times, and uh, high heterogeneity uh, can be um, uh, seen in our uh, analysis. And in conclusion, we can say that platelet rich plasma, uh, based on our study, is non-inferior to triamcinone acetonide in the treatment of uh, patchy alopecia areata. 
and uh, it could be a great steroid treatment modality in alopecia areata, which can be used in unlimited number of treatment sessions without the increasing risk of adverse events, and it can also be an alternative in case of steroid uh, phobia. However, further high-quality RCTs are needed to better assess the efficacy and strengthen the quality of evidence with longer follow-up periods where we can see further differences between the two groups, especially regarding recurrence rates, and also with different ways of administration, for example, the uh, application of PRP after microneedling or after carbon dioxide laser treatment, uh, which are less invasive ways of administration than injection and may decrease the pain related to administration. And of course, I've only shown the, um, the like a, a part of my results. We conducted several further analyses, uh, uh, subgroup analysis, and also uh, sensitivity analysis um, to achieve the highest possible uh, quality of our work. And to overview my three topics, my first project was the investigation of the utility of MBDA score for the monitoring of rheumatoid arthritis, which uh, results we published last December. Uh, the second study was the investigation of the efficacy of PRP in chronic wound management, also published last December. Uh, and uh, the third study was the investigation of the efficacy of PRP in alopecia areata, published uh, last July. And uh, I had the opportunity to participate in several further projects, so you can see my science matrix. Uh, regarding these, and my future plans include, of course, continuing my research while also gaining some clinical experience, which I had the opportunity to just start this September, and uh, also to participate in education both uh, in the methodological side, uh, in collaboration with CTM as a scientific methodology supervisor, and later on in a clinical side, hopefully. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank to those whom without my scientific work would not have been possible. Uh, I would like to start with my home institution, the Department of Dermatology, Venerology and Dermato-Oncology, uh, led by Professor Hollow. And I would like to express my gratitude to my supervisor, Andres Banvardi, for his continuous support. Uh, Professor Vikonkal, uh, the leader of our uh, research lab. Uh, Professor Shadi, the head of the doctoral program, and all my colleagues who helped me throughout my journey. And I would also like to express my gratitude to Professor Dior Nagy from the Department of Rheumatology and Clinical Immunology. And uh, lastly, uh, for the Center for Translational Medicine, led by Professor Hegyi, because uh, of course, without methodological support, I could not have achieved uh, 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 any of my results. And I would like to thank everyone who I had the opportunity to work with during the last years. Mm, and I would like to thank you for your attention uh, with this quote, there is no greater misfortune in the world than the loss of reason. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. And now we are at the second part of this uh, discussion, and uh, we need a, a vivid discussion during this session. If in, and if you allow me a, a personal and subjective remark, when I first saw at the <coughs> uh, entrance admission uh, the, the plan of your, your research, I was rather skeptic with this uh, platelet-rich plasma, what can happen, and, and it's not so very scientific. And now you have proved that it's uh, very important and then, uh, nice data, so I'm very interested what will the opponents say about it. So I'm asking uh, the first opponent from Yashi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> To, to ask questions, to, to present his opinion, so it's not a very uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, like it was earlier, but it's, it's rather discussion-centered. Um, um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, it is really an honor to be part of the first uh, PhD public defense of the CTM. Um, I would like to um, first ask ask uh, Fanny a couple of um, uh, yeah a couple of questions, and then I will give you my my, my brief comments uh, on on the thesis. Um, so I basically there will be three because you structured uh, the the thesis on, on three uh, parts. Um, the the um, advent of advanced imaging is 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 really great in the last decade. So we do get a lot of information from advanced imaging techniques, okay? Uh, and, um, and then on the other side, we have this um, 
we have this plethora of biomarkers uh, that, you know, everything can be turned into a biomarker these days. You think of something and then you do a little study and say, oh, this is a biomarker. Um, and, and you did this great work of, of looking at both things, radiology as an imaging tool, and then on MBDA as, as a score for, for these biomarkers. Um, but what is, and, and you drew some conclusion, you say that it is relevant, okay? Um, but we are at the center for translational medicine. And, and like Peter very well said, we are here for better healthcare, okay? What is your view that can, how, what, what's, if you have any thoughts or ideas, how you can implement this knowledge uh, better for, for the healthcare? Because just saying, okay, radiology and MBDS course are, are linked statistically. Uh, how does that help the patient in the end? Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, question and your comments. So, <clears throat> uh, of course, there's a plethora of new biomarkers, and uh, as you mentioned, it, uh, it's really hard to choose which, which are the best and how can they actually be used. I think um, in the case of MBDA score, uh, for two uh, reasons they can be used. Uh, the first one uh, is the uh, disease activity monitoring because of course uh, the clinical ass assessment is crucial uh, uh, in case of this uh, disease. Um, but uh, if we have uh, an objective tool to, to complement these uh, assessments which can be repeated easily, uh, even uh, more frequently than, uh, than the clinical assessment, uh, it can uh, mean a great help uh, and it can initiate uh, therapy, therapeutic changes earlier, for example. And the second part is the, uh, uh, the prediction of radiographic progression, which uh, uh, I've mentioned that can may in the future initiate uh, uh, um, also the, the starting therapies uh, of rheumatoid arthritis uh, diagnosed patients. And, uh, um, sorry. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I think I, I, <laughs> I will stop here. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, okay, um, thank you. Um, the second thing uh, is, is related to the PRP and the wound healing. And as you very well pointed out, it, it is a more and more used method out there. Um, and the challenge, uh, like it was, also said is proving that it works. And, and you've shown that it works to a, to a certain degree. Yes. Uh, my question is, have you looked at potential risks and side, uh, side effects of using PRP in wound healing? Because whenever you have these new methods, uh, many of them, let's say, word of, word of mouth transmitted in socially, um, but what about the actual, you know, risk and side effects that we also need to inform the patients for? Yeah. Thank you for your question. So we also wanted to assess uh, side effects as a secondary outcome. As, and I've, as I've mentioned, we could not conduct a quantitative analysis, but to summarize the results of separate studies, um, they were reported quite diversely, but uh, no, no studies uh, reported uh, any serious adverse events uh, re related to PRP treatment, and of course, nor to uh, conventional uh, ulcer treatment. And um, uh, basically, I think the only thing which we have to uh, look out for is patient selection. Uh, uh, of course, if uh, uh, someone uh, needs repeated treatment and is uh, anemic or has a low platelet count, we, there's no uh, use of uh, or there's no point of using PRP. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I think it can be uh, a beneficial tool to complement the, uh, the currently used uh, conventional treatment methods. Thank you. And my last question, I promise, is um, the, the PRP for alopecia. Um, in um, the way I see it is it is a matter more of um, the, the efficacy is very much related, and you pointed out this in the thesis, is very much related to the actual procedure itself of the PRP. And you mentioned the heterogeneity of the data, uh, meaning that the PRP procedure itself can be performed in, in many ways. Yes. Um, do you have any, uh, any actual plans to help standardize this? Because again, translational medicine means forward translation, but it's also the reverse translation part. So we go back to the bench. You, you, you find something into the clinic, in the real world, 
uh, and then you need to go back to the guys you know at the bench and developing these methods. Do you have any plans to work on that? Like push some sort of standardization of PRP to say, listen, only this method works good or that method or you know help the, the, the bench side of the translation part. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Yeah, uh, yes, we absolutely plan to uh, explore uh, this area uh, in uh, Hungary. The use of platelet-rich plasma, platelet-rich plasma itself uh, is a, uh, a blood product. It counts as a blood product, so we can't just use it uh, anytime uh, at the clinic uh, case by case, but we have to have an ethical approval and use PRP as part of a clinical trial. So we would like to do that in the future uh, to be able to to, to exper uh, experiment uh, which PRP uh, preparation method is the best uh, for the treatment of alopecia variant and also for the treatment of uh, chronic wounds. Thank you. Um, and then I will just jump to, to, to the conclusions of my, of my uh, evaluation. Um, the results of this extensive three studies research PhD um, thesis were all published in high impact factor peer review journals, which validates in itself the quality of the work that you have done. So overall, I strongly recommend the open defense of the work. And of course, after the successful defense today, granting the PhD degree to uh, Fanny Adel Mesneric medical degree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And because we are now have an informal discussion, and before I'm handing over the microphone, I had also two questions. Uh, and these are concerning the biohazard, which may be related to this uh, uh, plasma. Do you have any data during these studies that there were some infections or thrombosis with, this, with the use of these uh, preparations? Thank you for your question. Uh, uh, no, so also we try to assess uh, as just like adverse event rate, infection rate as well. And uh, we, we saw two types of reporting. One of them just said that no infection was reported and this, these were the mo mo cases uh, most of the time. And the other option was that uh, they concluded in their studies, uh, the, the authors, that, uh, that the infection rates were lower in the PRP group than in the control group. This might be due to the fact that the healing time was uh, uh, faster, so there was a lower chance for uh, infection this way. And thank you very much. Okay, well, funny, first of all, it was great. And I think that the applause at the end demonstrated how good your presentation was. And I was just thinking whether, do you have a recording of your first progress report? <laughs> and compare the progress from there this is really amazing. I would, be, would, I would like to start for the next year PhD students somehow evaluating the progression you guys are making because that is unbelievable and heads off for the Translation of Medicine for providing this platform. And um, uh, we also tested your endurance, so the baby crying was planned, by the way. But it stopped you once. It only stopped you once, right? So you did very well. You did very well. Thank you. And... Um, I, I participated on PhD defenses like this several times in Scandinavia, and then uh, there was one hour for me to ask questions, so I prepared questions for one hour from now on, <laughs> and I will have questions to each and every one of your topics. So the first is, um, I really enjoyed uh, this multimodal uh, biomarker story, and um, I'm, I'm also involved in biomarker research, and these biomarkers, uh, just as the previous opponent said, they are coming out uh, weekly. There are just in the inflammatory business, there are more than 250, and it's increasing by the day. So do you believe that uh, this multimodal current structure of biomarkers will change over time? And before you answer, I would like to ask you not to thank me for my questions, just okay. answer, okay? Okay. First of all, I, I am afraid there are some YouTube recordings of the first progress report as well. <laughs> uh, and... Um, uh, yes, so uh, the, um, MBD score and the planning of MBD score uh, started uh, in the 2010, around 2010, with uh, multiple biomarkers, not just these 12, which were finally included. And uh, after uh, uh, 
lengthy uh, research, they included these 12 biomarkers. But of course, uh, when this, so I, I hope that these are the ones which should be included finally. But of course, when we start to use it uh, more widely, uh, it might uh, result in some further modifications. Or, uh, sorry or for interrupting, but 2010, which was ages ago in the field yes. of biomarker research. So I cannot really imagine that this is going to be your final panel forever. Yeah, there's absolutely a room for room for changing this. Uh, so uh, we can we can just uh, wait for the m more data, basically, when we use it more widely. I think. And this is my second question in this topic: that that uh, you compared the performance of this multimodal uh, approach to well-established to other models which use two markers, CRP and ESR. And let me tell you, I'm not using now CRP at all, almost in my practice for information evaluation. And ESR is completely out of uh, business. So uh, can we compare the efficacy of that treatment, which is possibly obsolete already, or, or at least should be obsolete? Yes, uh, absolutely correct. We also wanted to um, uh, compare the performance of MDDS score to other uh, measures. I think it would be the best to compare it to, um, to uh, disease activity measures which only contain the clinical assessment. That would be the cleanest way, yeah. I think. And uh, uh, CDA score is, would be that. For example, we also included that as an outcome measure, but unfortunately most studies did not report uh, it. We, we had some studies reporting results with similar uh, correlations actually, but we could not put data on that. So, uh, so these are the, uh, the outcomes that we had basically in the, in the article, so that's why we, we could pull data on these. But yes, I have uh, more yeah, questions, but, but I will skip them, right? So next topic is um, it is very intriguing, your result, that uh, platelet-rich uh, plasma treatment uh, caused, had a uh, more than five times higher chance of wound closure and more than eight times higher chance of wound closure in venous um, origin of the, of the, of the uh, lesion uh, as compared to standard treatment. And, um, but the timing uh, wasn't clear to me. So within what time frame did the wounds close? Because that is also very important. And so, you know, just for me uh, to, to imagine if uh, uh, I have a problem like that in a few years' time, then what can I expect? Yes, yeah, so um, there were uh, different follow-up times used, uh, but the mo most common one was uh, uh, three months, six months, and uh, one year follow-up times, and we, uh, also made subgroup analysis based on the follow-up time, uh, actually, uh, and we have we seen. I did not have the time to present that, but uh, we seen similar results. So uh, yeah, the, the results which I've shown, we can see um, uh, for each study the latest time when they assessed uh, the wounds or the patients, um, and we also conducted a multi-level analysis and uh, included this uh, time difference across studies uh, as a variable, so, so we accounted for this uh, difference between the studies, uh, but uh, altogether I can say that it was mainly uh, three and six months. And does that mean that those who were in the control group, when did they wounds close actually? Do you, ha do you remember? So, I mean, with, because I can understand that there's a five or eight times higher chance that the wound will be closed at the, close, uh, at the latest follow-up time. But in, 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 in the actual uh, real life, what does that mean? So patients are expected to have their wounds closed in the uh, platelet-rich plasma group within one year, and the others never, or two years, or a year and a half, or just one month later? Yes, yeah, so uh, I don't have specific data on that, no. so I can only tell you what uh, I think that most of these wounds, or a lot of these wounds, not ever close, close basically, yeah. or, or, or after a li really long time uh, with a huge amount of human resource uh, and uh, wound care, as I've mentioned. So, yes, so also we included the healing time uh, as, a, as an outcome, but that was also reported uh, quite diversely, so I can't tell you a specific uh, pooled results regarding this, but... Uh, Yes. Okay, I don't want to fire all my bullets, only just one last question regarding your third topic, that 
you mentioned that uh, um, platelet-rich plasma is not inferior to the other treatments. However, pain was more intense in your systematic review part. Now, pain is a very subjective thing. And was it that more patients reported pain or the intensity of the pain? And if the intensity, did they give any measures, I mean, the authors, about uh, visual analogs, scales, course, uh, just to have some kind of imagination, what is the, the intensity of pain difference between the treated and the control arm? Yes, so some studies used visual analog scale and assessed pain in both groups, and then they found most of the time that uh, in the PRP group uh, these scores were higher. And sometimes it, pain was just reported as a, a problem related to the administration, and it was reported in the PRP group. Um, so the reason for that, I, I, I cannot be sure about that, of course. Uh, maybe that uh, blood was drawn from the patients who... Uh, uh, received PRP treatment and they were like uh, in more stress anyway. Uh, but uh, yes, so these were the results. Yeah, so these are unresolved mm -hmm. issues. And this last comment of mine that these are unresolved issues leads to my very last question. That you presented three very interesting thought-provoking uh, studies and the results are also give a lot of fuel for thoughts. And uh, you clearly indicated that you're going to continue with your research and uh, which is closest to your heart out of the three topics and to designing and what are your plans in that topic closest to your heart is going to be a randomized controlled trial, a registry, an observational study. Uh, yes, so I think uh, I can say that platelet-rich plasma treatment is uh, really interesting for me and I would like to continue uh, my work uh, related to this topic and as my supervisor is the head of the ulcer management unit at the clinic, I think uh, I would uh, continue on that part of uh, PRP use. This would have been my choice as well, <laughs> after reading the thesis, really. So my evaluation, I think it's, uh, um, it's a great work, it's been evaluated by top journals, so uh, I really, I'm not... Uh, uh, a candidate for evaluating or overruling whatever they said, and you generated the, the highest level of the, of the evidence pyramid, systematic review and meta-analysis, so I'm absolutely in support of the defense, and uh, hopefully it's going to be successful, and I would be really happy to see the PhD after your name. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiring suggestions. And now it's open for the public. So I think the, the PhD students should also ask questions because when there were the progress reports, I remember they were very active. So I think they should be actually as well. Jakubo Fritz, I congratulate yes. to a very nice presentation. I would like to ask about the first topic. Uh, and about those biomarkers, because most of the patients with er rheumatoid arthritis are treated in small centers. Are these also available in small centers? Thank you for your question. So the, bio, the MDDS score yes. evaluation? No, it's currently not available. So every, anyone can purchase it, any clinic, but it's not available widely it, at any center. Thank you. Thank you. And we have also members of the commissions. Don't forget them if you have questions. <clears throat> Thank you, and I, I really congratulate uh, to the work first. Um, my question to the first part of, the, uh, of your talk or, and work is, uh, did you have a chance to, to correlate um, members or parts of the, um, of the um, MBDA score with the radio radiographic progression? Whether, because there are uh, different um, cytokines in these uh, different uh, um, types of um, uh, laboratory um, measures. And some of them, uh, at least theoretically, have a higher chance to co co um, um, be associated with radio radiographic um, progression. So did you have a chance to look at that? Thank you for your question. Unfortunately, the study has only reported the overall MBDA scores and their correlations with the radiographic progression, for example, or all the disease activity measures. So we could not do that, but that would be a great aim for the future, for example, to, to correlate uh, the 
radiography progression or the radi radiographic status with um, MMP uh, one or three, for example, which are parts of the MBDA score. Okay, thanks. And then, then the the second part um, um, with the uh, with the ulcer uh, part. Um, basically, um, ulcers uh, could be really different in 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 their um, pathogenesis. So, and and you've mentioned that uh, the diabetic ulcers are, are behaving differently from, from the uh, venous ulcers. Do you have an explanation for that? Uh, I don't have an uh, like a, uh, exact explanation for that. I have ideas. One of them is that uh, uh, it's really hard to, uh, to assess the confounding factors, uh, especially in this patient group. Everyone has comorbidities uh, and uh, I, I assume, but it's, we don't have data on that, unfortunately, that in a diabetic ulcer group, uh, maybe the compliance uh, and the, the, the also the uh, management of the, uh, the original disease was not the same as in the venous ulcer group, but, uh, but don't, I don't have the specific answer. And, and one technical question, this is a little bit related to one of the f previous questions about um, the the, the measurement of the outcomes. So these are very long studies with the ulcer treatment. And many times when a patient enters the study, um, there's a chance that he or she will get uh, secondary treatments. Um, this is a huge problem in oncological trials that you have one intervention, you may have another intervention after you're progressing or after the patient is progressing or not responding. Um, do these trials actually report on secondary treatments or the patients had to stay in the trial for one year or, or two years and could have not uh, had any other, other in interventions um, sec uh, subsequently in these trials because that could actually ver um, very um, significantly um, influence the results or the outcomes. Yeah, so the studies reported uh, the uh, the treatment re related to the ulcer management itself, so those uh, therapies were not changed during the study period. However, uh, we could not, uh, they did not report, so we can, cannot know uh, how the, um, uh, the treatment of the, the underlying disease is changed. For example, these are not reported, so that can be, uh, um, of course, a, a problem and that can also influence our results. Uh, regarding the ulcer management, uh, it was reported uh, most of the time, basically, that uh, that they they sticked to the original. Uh, but the studies uh, were actually um, how long usually? Three months, six months, uh, twelve uh, months um, period. Yes, yes. Th these were the so most they were common different, ones. Different, uh, different, or some some of them, of course, had several follow up times, like after six, uh, three months, six months, and uh, twelve months. Some of them only after twelve months, for example. Okay, and now, now one, one uh, last question, at least for the moment, uh, with the alopecia areata trials. Is there any difference between the volume, because I'm not really um, an expert in, in PRP treatment, uh, is there any difference in the volume of the PRP and the triamcinolone injection? Because if you inject five times more um, a volume, that will probably give uh, higher pain um, value, so is there any difference? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's also an option or the potential reason for the uh, for the pain related uh, to administration more uh, frequent in the PRP group. It was not reported specifically, uh, but there's uh, absolutely there's a, a chance chance for that, and that's also why it would be great to to try to apply PRP in other methods. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would also like to congratulate on your work and also the presentation. The presentation was absolutely logical and clear. And the two major benefits are, are great. I mean, it really helps the clinical decision and the patient's benefit. And on the other hand, which I think is also very important, it provokes further research, as you already described. My question related to the rheumatoid arthritis work is that you included these uh, 32 studies. Uh, in your analysis, were the patients included in these 32 studies um, heterogeneous? So all kinds of patients uh, depending on therapy response
non-responsiveness or specific therapies or other types of characteristics because rheumatoid arthritis is really a broad range of features. Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, they were quite diverse. Uh, we tried to make subgroup analysis based on mm, therapies uh, and all other laboratory parameters which were uh, assessed uh, in the at the initiation of the therapies, but uh, unfortunately we did not have enough data to, to, to do that. But yes, this is also a limitation of us, the, the diverse uh, patient group, mm -hmm, definitely. That yes. would be really interesting to see whether the therapy responsive and the difficult to treat RA patients differ regarding this correlation or, or regarding the conclusions. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and the, the other question also related to this part is, you said that it might, pers might help personalize the treatment. What do you mean by that? How can it specifically personalize the treatment? So what kind of key milestones are there or what kind of key features are there to determine whether above certain MBDA levels you decide to choose, let's say, conventional therapy on or some biological therapy or what biological therapy? Yes, thank you for your question. Well, I definitely don't have the answer for that. Uh, there are um, MBDA score categories already determined, uh, which say low, moderate, and high disease mm -hmm. activity. So below 30, it's low. Uh, between 30 and uh, 44, it's moderate. And above uh, 44, it's high disease activity. Um, and based on this, these categories, uh, we could, in the future, maybe establish some protocols uh, regarding uh, therapy initiation and also therapy uh, modifications. Uh, but we could not investigate this uh, topic yet, uh, so so that's that's for the future definitely. Okay, and regarding the PRP, that's also very interesting. And uh, my question would have been the same as Professor Yola is regarding the uh, the standardization of these patients, but you already answered that. Uh, my other question is much more, let's say, conceptual or theoretical. Uh, I know it's difficult to answer, but maybe you have some ideas. Uh, what are the molecular mechanisms for PRP to be active in these conditions? Of course, this is very fashionable and very promising, but what do you think in the background? How can it help? Yes, yeah, so uh, the cytokines and the growth factors, especially the uh, vascular and growth factor, epidermal growth factors, the uh, platelet-derived growth factors, which are... Um, measured uh, in PRP in several studies and, and have a higher concentration. Uh, I think these are the key elements uh, in their uh, tissue repairing and uh, regenerating uh, properties of PRP. Mm -hmm. so. Are there any preclinical data on that? Animal experimental or, or ex vivo uh, ex, data? Ex, ex vivo uh, 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 models are available. Uh, so. There's, I found some studies which measured these uh, um, these factors uh, in PRP, but uh, but I can't give you specifics, uh, unfortunately. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, and congratulations once more. Thank you. Congratulations, first of all, it was a perfect presentation, I think, and you also presented quite well the statistical plots and results, so congratulations again. And we also Thank congratulate you. for your all work, uh, so your research, because it showed me the power of meta-analysis, because not just you answer questions, but as we saw in the audience, it has also raised a lot of questions. And I think this is one of the purposes of meta-analysis, to see what questions need to be answered in the future. So Thank congratulations. You. And uh, I would like to first say that you can cook, of course, from things that are available in the studies. However, corresponding to the first topic, I think that correlation is just an initial uh, thing that we can check when we talk about prediction performance. So, uh, of course, the studies publish correlations. That's why um, it was the measure that you, you uh, were able to meta-analyze. But besides correlation, I think it's good to emphasize a lot of things, uh, good to check a lot of things. Uh, and 
Uh, what I would like to say is that for me, the correlation was quite low. So it showed me that it is barely working uh, alone. And this is my question, actually, that so I can imagine this score uh, in a, as a part in a, in a complicated model. So I think that not alone this score, but with clinical things and with other things can provide a good prediction. And did you see uh, such result in the literature? This is my question. When uh, more complex uh, models were applied and assessed. Thank you for your question. Yes, uh, MBDS scores definitely um, here for supplement and not to um, um, not to replace uh, the conventionally used disease activity measures, which contain also the subjective assessment of disease activity. And it would also be really interesting to to see it in, not just to use it as a supplement, but also to 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 include in the models uh, the, the results of the clinical assessment. It would not make it objective anymore, but, uh, but maybe it would provide even bit better results yes, than I just I using see. it in combination. So, yes, that so would you be... try, I think, to build a better prediction <laughs> model in the future. It's a good direction. I have a small other question, is that your control was uh, some kind of steroid treatment, and you said steroid phobia. Phobia means that uh, fear without so much reason. Is it true that we don't have to fear from uh, from steroids, steroid treatments? Yeah, so uh, it, it, it depends on the situation, I think. So, of course, uh, there are some uh, adverse events, as I mentioned, and of course, for several further adverse events, uh, especially in case of uh, systemic use of steroids, but uh, these are very great therapies as well and useful therapies, so uh, especially in that initiation of uh, therapy of several conditions. So, uh, so they are a crucial part of uh, patient care. And uh, of course, uh, lengthened use of steroids can be harmful. But uh, uh, the steroid phobia, which I mentioned, is the, the irrational fear of steroids mm -hmm. without... Uh, Exaggerated yeah. fear, we can say. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. And Thank congratulations you. again for your nice work. Thank you. This is just about to make the committee sweat, too. Uh, because this is an open question or maybe a remark. I mean, this PRP, this is very interesting. Because, I mean, as, as Professor, uh, Professor Hayes asked, I mean, that what are the mechanisms? Actually, we do not know because there are so many different components here. And I, I, I don't know anything about dermatology, but I see a little bit of dentistry and, uh, and orthopedics when they also use this. And then, actually, what happens is that the 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 range of responsiveness or non-responsiveness is quite wide. So one of the reasons, I mean, I'm asking this actually because you just stated that you want to keep going on this. So one of the reasons for this that, I mean, PRP contains, PRP, PRF, this kind of preps, I mean, contain quite a few uh, pro-regenerative factors. But when somebody is in a chronic inflammation, Maybe in the whole body, and especially in the circulation, there might be some pro-inflammatory factors which actually neutralize this. So I just wonder, I mean, that is probably a kind of uh, impossible vision, I mean, to have the same kind of uh, cocktail to give to everybody, because, I mean, the, to, to, to the patients. But one possibility is actually to neutralize some of this. I mean, just using a kind of immune neutralization cocktail together, I mean, against the pro-inflammatory components on this. And it actually, it may decrease the range of the, of the standard deviation and also make a better treatment. So have you considered something like this or how to deal with this? Uh, thank you for your question. We not yet have considered this. Uh, I think it, this would be a bit more suitable in case of alopecia areata, because in chronic wounds, uh, we would not want to suppress the immune system, I think, in any, any uh, potential way. But, uh, yeah. Yes. Before you, I mean, before giving the treatment, so not the patient, but mm -hmm. systematically.
Ah, okay. okay sorry. Because I just wanted to mention that in case of alopecia areata, there's also a, a, an immunosuppressant path of treatment, and uh, it's not yet investigated to use, for example, uh, JAK inhibitors in combination with uh, local PRP treatment, topical PRP treatment, but that would be an option as well to treat the disease systemically and also um, locally. But uh, yes, in case of chronic wounds and uh, the combination of immunomodulation uh, with PRP locally, we have not uh, thought of it yet. <laughs> but thank you for the suggestion. So thank you. I think now we are at the end of the discussion and uh, I'm closing now uh, the first part and we are uh, retiring to, to take our decision. After a long discussion and deliberation, finally we decided that you have passed this exam. <laughs> and the mathematical average is five. 100%. So I think it was a very nice presentation with very interesting data. We discussed it. Uh, we also hope that you will continue and use this data in your further work. So congratulations again. And now I'm closing this session. She was the first to have her uh, final exam, her final presentation, and I think for the first ones who are beginning their studies, it's a very nice example and it's very inspiring how she did it. She was a very, uh, it was a very nice presentation, really. It was great. Uh, it felt great, especially at the end when, <laughs> when the last question was uh, finalized. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I, I hope it was great, and I'm really grateful for everyone who uh, came and supported me. So yes, I'm a bit overwhelmed still. I think it's a great moment, an exciting moment here uh, that, that we've been a part of, and I'm honored and glad to, to be a part of this. Uh, because uh, it was the first um, uh, public defense uh, of the CTM uh, and it sets the bar high uh, in terms of expectations uh, for the future 74, if I remember correctly, uh, PhD uh, students enrolled in the program. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a good example of how things should be done. Uh, and of course, um, because the goal is, is healthcare, uh, and transforming healthcare and improving healthcare. Um, the, the lessons that we learn here are very, very important. Uh, in, uh, I was glad to see uh, Fanny, you know, keeping her feet well, well put into the ground, uh, in touch with the patients, in, in, in touch with the clinical practice, and, and encouraged by the audience, by the, by the uh, uh, committee, even by her own experiences uh, that she will, you know, reach back to the clinical world and try to, to bring all that knowledge that she presented today to, to improve the, the patient's healthcare. Uh, it was a really great honor to be able to be the first one from the Center for Translational Medicine PhD program to defend my PhD and I got also tremendous help from the center uh, both in the organization part uh, and also from, of course, in the last years, the methodological part and support, continuous support from everyone.